I had a dream about giving this talk about a week ago, and um, I was a, a bald man standing on the stage, and there was this massive mosquito that was sort of going to sit on my head, and I was worried that if I hit it, there's going to be blood all over my face. So <laughs> luckily, there's no um, big mosquitoes here today, <laughs> which is a big relief. So um, I'm talking about abnormal treatment behavior, and I, I just want to say to you that I've been breaking my head about this for a very long time. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about this because I find that when I put myself out there to give talks like this, I, I do each time I understand something new about it. And, and, and as such, I'm here to get to the bottom of this with you. I'm not here to convince you or to sell you a story um, or anything like that. So hopefully we'll be able to think about this together and I could leave today's talk understanding this interesting and very complicated phenomenon a little bit better. So, to start with, I'm not really sure whether abnormal treatment behavior is the right topic or the right language to use here, because this is so prevalent, we all do it, that you could almost argue that it's not abnormal, it's, it's normal, because normality, as you all know, is defined within a population. But let's, let's explore that a little bit further. Today we'll talk about why doctors are distressed, how does stress leads to abnormal treatment behavior? How do I identify it? We'll look at some examples. And then we c we'll talk about what we can do about it to minimize it. So quite a lot to cover. So health workers, especially doctors, I think are in crisis, right? According to Beyond Blue in 2013, one in four of us have had suicidal thoughts. And one in five of us have been treated or diagnosed with depression. It's quite clear that the ability to do pediatric work comes at a considerable, considerable psychological cost. Why would that be the case? Well, this is important to me. This is my story in, um, in the vein of, of storytelling. Is I was a very distressed intern when I started working in the real life of medicine, and perhaps that's why I ended up being a psychiatrist, so I could treat myself. <laughs> what <a laughs> yeah. So what happened to me is I engaged in some, if not all, of these abnormal treatment behaviors that we'll talk about today, and, and I suspect that you do too. I think psychiatry has a lot to offer. Let's look at some of the factors um, that affect our treatment behavior. And I just want to say that these are all good developments. They're not bad developments, but we as doctors need to keep up with the shifting landscape. So first of all, in, in pediatrics, who the patient is is not clearly defined. The, the, the baby exists as part of a dependency dyad with the mother. And as such, the space between the mother and the child is a sacred space. You enter into that space at your own peril. The, the, those of you who have seen the movie The Revenant would know what happened to DiCaprio when he got stuck in that space between the mother cup and the bear. That was really ugly. Yet, in the work that I do, I get drawn into that space every single patient, every single day. And that's a distressing space to be in. And for me, there's a fine line between distress, being disturbed, and, and losing your mind. What it means to be a patient is changing too. Historically, the patient was someone who was sick and needed care, but now we deal with patients, customers, consumers, and clients. And the use of language is really important here because each of these words has a specific implication that uniquely affect the doctor-patient relationship. Patients are sick, they need care. Consumers are there to get a good deal. Customers are always right, right? And then consumers are there to get a good deal. What it means to be a doctor is changing. Historically, we as doctors were just supposed to or expected to know our stuff, make a diagnosis, and the patient would get better. But now, in line with new developments, in line with CANMEDS, we're expected to be professionals, you know, health advocates, scholars, um, all sorts of things. So this is um, an important shift. Two, 
We live in an era of chronic disease. Historically, if you got a diagnosis, you either got better or you did not, you died. But now a diagnosis implies chronicity and a long, difficult road ahead. We live in a death-denying culture. If a patient dies, it should be someone's fault, right? And if a child dies, it's even worse, because death should not occur in the developmental stage of childhood. So that's going to be very distressing for everyone. There's been a shift in the power differential. Historically, the doctors had all the, the power. But now our patients are powerful. They're empowered and powerful, right? They, they turn up with knowledge onto the teeth from Dr. Google. You can bet your Nelly that they would have Googled you on Rate My MD. <laughs> they, accompanied by the patient rights advisor, they, make, they have rights, they make complaints, they call Ryan's rules and then they um, sell their story to the media. Now, um, there's been a shift in the landscape from innocent until proven guilty to guilty until proven innocent, where social media is the judge and the jury. Uh, the um, APRA was seriously considering making unsubstantiated complaints public, and I understand that that's not been upheld. Thank goodness for that. Last but not least, there's been a, a shift in intern, house officer, and registrar-driven care to consultant-driven care. These days, registrars find themselves in training positions at a fairly green stage of their development, and no one wants to see the registrar. Everyone wants to see the consultant, and as a consultant, I feel that's not fair. I've done the hard yards as a registrar, but now... <laughs> 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 All the patients want to see me. So these are some of the factors, but what underpins doctor distress? The, the case that I'm making today is that doctor distress is underpinned by a communication mismatch. And the reason for that is that there's been a shift in what it means to be a patient and there's been a change in what it means to be a doctor. All human relationships have a transactional underpinning. And this transactional underpinning has changed. What that means is that what the patient is there to get, the doctor is not there to give. That then results in patients having unmet needs, patient dissatisfaction, patient distress, abnormal illness behavior, and for me, there's nothing as distressing as a dissatisfied, upset, angry, resentful patient. So, what is treatment behaviour? Treatment behaviour at its most basic level is simply how we behave as doctors when we're treating our patients. And I've talked about some of the factors, some of the factors that affect that. But what else affects treatment behaviour? How are we thinking and feeling, right? But here's the thing. We are mostly not aware of what we're thinking and feeling. Freud famously discovered the unconscious mind in the previous century, and to my way of thinking, that's the most extraordinary thing that's ever been discovered. What that means is that the mind is like an iceberg where most of what we're thinking and feeling sits outside of conscious awareness. What that means is that patients stir up strong feelings in us that we're mostly not aware of. And not only is that true for the patient, for the doctor, that's true for the patient also. That then results in the doctor and the patient being like two blind people in a room trying to find each other with severe communication mismatch on either side. That then results for a complicated relationship with complicated thoughts, feelings and behavior, behaviours on either side of this equation. So thoughts and feelings affect our treatment behaviour, but illness behaviour affects our treatment behaviour too. So let's look at what illness behaviour is. So normal illness behaviour is simply how a reasonable patient will behave when they're feeling sick. What that means is that they'll feel that something is wrong, they'll worry about it, they'll go and see a doctor, they'll expect to tell their story, They'll, they'll expect to get a physical examination done, special investigations, and then to be given a diagnosis. That then is normal treatment behaviour on the part of the doctor. But here's the thing. Illness behaviour is embedded in the sick role, and the sick role 
is a social construct. Illness is what doctors treat, therefore it's up to the doctor to grant or deny the sick role. The sick role is transactional and comes with certain privileges and obligations. First, the obligations. The person seeking the sick role is expected to acknowledge that it's uncool to be sick, they shouldn't want to be sick. Secondly, they should you know, agree to do whatever it is that they can do to get better. And in return for that, what they get is that we don't blame them for being sick, we give them care, and we, they, we don't expect them to carry out the usual obligations that we would otherwise expect of them. The sick role, therefore, is a social currency that can be exchanged for any goods or services of any kind. Just like money can be used to buy services and goods. Well, what's onerous for me, for us as doctors then, is the realisation of what a difficult task it is that society is giving us to grant or deny the sick role. For example, if a customer is always right, turns up expecting to be given the sick role, and, and me as the doctor goes, no way, I don't think you're sick, there's going to be distress on both sides of this equation. That brings us to abnormal treatment behaviour then, and that's simply classified as over or under investigation, diagnosis, treatment and referral. And I want us to look at some of the examples here, and there's thousands of these, but I, I think I'll try and use some of the highlights of these. Illness affirming, where we say, yes, you, you do have an illness, you deserve the sick role, and illness denying, where we go, no, you're not sick, you don't deserve the sick role. And interestingly, our motivation for doing so is either aware, in conscious awareness or outside of conscious awareness. That means that I know that I'm giving you the sick role, and I know what my motivation is. Where I don't know about what my motivation is, that is unconsciously driven. Now, let me give you some examples of where I would give the sick role where I'm aware of my motivation for doing so. Um, for business reasons, right? If I can make money out of giving a diagnosis to a patient. For convenience reasons, if, if I tell a, a, um, a family or a mum that she has depression and I can give her an antidepressant rather than sit with her and talk to her about her role transitions, and when I'm, I want to cover my training deficits, my favourite example here is the neurology registrar who, who doesn't really know the difference between epileptic and non-epileptic seizures and then just say, oh, well, I'm going to give you an anticonvulsant as long as my consultant doesn't know I'm stuffing it up here. Unconscious reasons for giving the sick role. The narcissistic doctor, we all have narcissistic reasons for doing things, but some doctors have a an unconscious need to be liked by their patients and to be admired by their colleagues. The, the doctor who, Munchausen's um, in, in doctors, with the doctor who has an unconscious need to diagnose a severe and complicated disease in every patient they see. I had a friend at med school who um, tried to diagnose a few chromosotoma in every patient he saw because he was hoping the professor would think he's super smart. An illness denying where we know that we um, where, where we know what our motivation is for denying illness. When we're colluding with patients, is a good example, with insurance reports. And then when it's just going to be too bloody difficult to make a diagnosis, my favourite example, I do it all the time even though I try not to, is when there's a really difficult mum and her daughter has anorexia, it's much easier for me to say, oh, you've just got a food sensitivity and abnormal eating behaviour, let's not call it anorexia, so because it's just going to be too hard. And then when we deny illness and our reasons for doing so is unconscious, good examples here include where there's a threat to our fantasy of omnipotence. <laughs> the other good example here is when... Um, when treatment fails, the doctor who calls me up and says, oh, Johnny's dying, but I'm not sure he had it in the first place. <laughs> so, what can we do about it? Firstly, and most importantly, it's really important that you're aware that there is such a thing as abnormal treatment behaviour, and to pick up the danger signs. What are they? I don't know. 
I think there's thousands of them. It's important that you know yourself and know how you respond to patients. What I can tell you is that what my colleagues do when they call me up is they say the following things, which, which to me means consultation there is in psychiatry needs to move forward. Doctor, or Yanni, I just don't know, but this patient's really getting to me. I don't know why, but I find myself doing stuff that I wouldn't usually do. Or I just really have a big urge to, to do something with this family, and I don't know why that is. So when that happens, is what I want you to do, or what a good thing to do is to, to stop, to take a step back and to think. Problems start when thinking stops. There's a golden rule in psychiatry that, and that is, it's important to do as much nothing as possible, which, which is an incredibly difficult thing to do. It, it means that it's much harder to think than it is to act. Don't just do something, stand there. If you can think unpleasant thoughts and feel unpleasant feelings and articulate them, you won't have to do dumb stuff. So how can we do that? It's not an easy thing. Reflection is the antidote to abnormal treatment behavior. Reflection is the antidote to behaving badly. A good thing to do is to have a trusted colleague and to give yourself permission to feel these things and to think these thoughts and to talk to them without judgment and say, I have these feelings and thoughts. I want to talk about that to you. I think it's important clinical information. What does this mean? What does it tell me about the patient? What does it tell me about me? It's a good idea to have a mentor, a senior colleague that you can talk to and trust, or um, to get supervision in either individually or in groups. When it does become apparent that you do need therapy, don't hesitate. A lot of us do. I think most psychiatrists do. <laughs> right. So, my take-home message then is... For you to be able to truly get the narrative of what the patient is there to give you, you must give yourself permission to think the thoughts you don't want to think and to feel the feelings you don't want to feel. I know we live in the era of you, if you can't measure it, don't mention it, but it is very important to acknowledge the information that patients are putting into you. It tells you a lot about what's going on and also to think about what you as a person brings to the patient consultation. So if you can do that, we all need help to do that, so um, you, we need all the help we can get. So if you can do that, you'll leave, you will be able to give your patients the most therapeutic intervention of all medicine has to offer, and that is for the patient to be genuinely understood by you, their doctor. Thanks. Thank you very much, Yanni. Um, I think that summary that when thinking stops, problems start is so instructive. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I just had one question. You, you've spoken a lot about abnormal treatment behaviour for doctors. Is this just all about doctors? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm, I'm sure that there's um, a, well abnormal treatment behaviour in, in non-doctors. What... I think what is important to acknowledge, though, is that although everyone is important, we're all different and we all have different roles. And us as doctors who exist in a fiduciary capacity, by which I mean that society does give us a, a special responsibility by giving or denying the sick role, that's a role that we, we've got a... That's a responsibility we, we can't deny. I, I wish every day that I'm not in that position because I don't like saying to consumers that they don't... you know meet criteria for the sick role. Um, ASD is a really good example. When, I, um, when people are desperate to, to get a, a, an ASD diagnosis for care. And I, I do think that we as doctors need to, to acknowledge our responsibility and, and to, to live up to that responsibility. But, but I'm sure that there's um, you know, abnormal treatment behaviour in nursing staff and, and allied health professionals too. 
And just partic I'm just particularly interested in doctors because they, they call me all the, all the time. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Claire, what's happening on the Twitter? On the Twitter? Um, I think... My, ooh, <laughs> Um, I think a lot of people are reflecting on what you were saying about how our role as a doctor is changing and a lot of people were really touched by that and expanding on that on Twitter, mm. which is very interesting. Um, and also um, a lot of people talking about the importance of mentorship as well. Mm. Um, so, yeah, great. Okay. Thanks. A question down the front too. Is that time? Yeah. yeah. We have back and chat. Have you have time? Or? Yeah. yeah. So thanks so much, Yanni. I think for me behind that talk is the theme of taking us as acute care clinicians to a place of mindfulness and thinking about the way we relate to our patients, both in terms of caring for them, but also the needs that we bring to that transaction, as you call it. And I think that we're not very good at reflecting on that in critical care, but psych seems to have embedded that a lot in their supervision. And I'm just wondering, uh, what advice could you give us as a culture in terms of learning to get to that reflective space? Mm. Well, thanks, thanks, Ben, for asking that. I, I think I, I just needed to make that clear. I think in, in paediatrics, and that's why I respect you folks so much, is there's, there's a time for thinking and there's a time for acting. And, and in paediatrics and emergency care, for example, that's a good time to act. You can't be having touchy-feely feelings when, you, when your patient's dying, which is why I'm in psychiatry when, when a patient gets a a cardiac arrest, the first thing I do is give myself a beta blocker. <laughs> so um, I, I do think it's, it's important to acknowledge that there is a time to act and then there is a time to think. The, the first um, thing to do is to give permission and to create a culture where it is okay to think unpleasant thoughts and feel unpleasant feelings and to see that as very important information that helps you understand the patient's formulation a little bit better. So create a culture where it's important information where it's okay to talk about it, to not see it as a character flaw, um, and then when the time is right, to strike when the iron is cold, and to, to then sort of give an opportunity for people to really bring what it is that, that this patient has, has brought to them, and, and the group, because we, we do process these things in the collective consciousness, and group detoxification of toxic effect is a very powerful thing that I think the emergency physicians um, have been using for a long time, but, but perhaps can improve on a little bit. Thanks. We have time for one more question. There's a microphone just here, if you can pop to it. Thank you. It's a bit high. Um, I'm just a general ped in, um, in Adelaide, and when you have um, patients that you recognise are triggering something in you, um, I suppose uh, um, what's the process for either, you know, just acknowledging that and sitting with that and recognising that or handing them on to another colleague? You know, is there a way that you would kind of break up with the patient um, or is that fair on your colleagues <laughs> mm. <laughs> to pass them on? Just send them to sales psych. <laughs> well, that, that's a really tricky question because there is such a thing as um, an unsalvageable relationship and, and I guess the question there relates to what is the work that needs to be done? If it's a resuscitation, if it's ABC, airway breathing, circulation, disability, and you don't have to use a lot of effective input. Chronic, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, don't, I can't really answer that. I wish I knew the answer. That's a really good question. So we'll have to think about that. Um, in psychiatry, what we, we, we try to do is to, to try and get to the bottom of why that's the case. And if it's you, then to get help, and if it's the patient, to reframe that into something workable. Um, what, what we very often find in psychiatry is a rupture, and then what happens is the doctor says, oh, I don't want to see this patient anymore, they hate me, they've complained about me, they're going, they're going to the media, can't you just see them? But then the, the real work that needs to be done there is on repair. And, and that is very difficult work, but it's very important work, and it can change a patient's life. Because we know, you know that all relationships are all about rupture and repair. You, you, you have disagreements, you fight, you don't get on with someone anymore, you call them up, you say, hey, let's think about this, let's, re let's repair this relationship. So I, I would argue that's a much better outcome than, than getting someone else to, to see them within limits. Thank you so very much for your time, Yanni.
Thanks, everyone.